speaking with Eric Householder. I, I never realized what a heroic job you have outside of legislature until we're sitting in a studio that has no air conditioning. So, um, come, we, on, we, come on over, Eric. Come we, on over. we wish you were here, sir. Yeah, I'm surprised Hornby didn't call that tight wad. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we've been saying that all morning, but we did not say it on air, Eric. <laughs> on my authority. <laughs> Come on out and fix it. <laughs> I just call it like it is, you know. Sorry. Sorry, right, Mike Hornby. <laughs> so what have you been doing for the last few weeks? Actually, I've been doing a lot of heating and air conditioning, mostly air conditioning. But uh, uh, two weeks ago, I spent all week in an attic. That's not a lot of fun. Um, uh, this weekend, I went down and did some service work for my uncle. I've been helping him out. He's 79. So I'll, I'll head down to, to Leesburg on the weekends to help him out, fix a lot of his service issues that he's having. And uh, it was pretty hot yesterday. That sun got to me. So, yes, that's what, I've been, that's what I've been doing. So when you're in a hot attic space, do you often encounter another creature that you really wish was not there sp sharing space with you? I cannot begin to tell people how many snakes are th that are in your houses that most people have no clue. Uh, I've seen snake skins, uh, squirrels, uh, birds, but most of the time there's a lot of snakes that are in people's houses, but uh, you'll see the snake skins crawl space the same way, but uh, they, yep, they get into your house and most people will just reject the fact that they have any snakes in their house, but they do, they just aren't aware of it. And sometimes these little critters will make themselves known and you'll see one. In fact, my sister saw a little tiny black snake, uh, I would call it a little ring snake, uh, she was vacuuming, and she looked down. There was this little tiny ring snake, probably about six or eight inches long, behind her recliner. I said, well, what did you do? She said, I just took the vacuum hose and sucked him right up, and then I took it outside <laughs> and opened up the vacuum and let him out. <laughs> well, Eric, if you're ever in my attic and you find snakes or snake skins, I will pay you $500 not to tell my wife. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Every now and then when you hear that little thump or you hear something, that's usually a snake. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you another place where they like to hide is in your basement, the top plate uh, of your masonry wall. They'll climb down in that. Your top plate, uh, when it, your top plate's only usually like seven and a half inches wide, and your block is like eight and a quarter. So there's just enough gap for those snakes to get down in there and hibernate all winter long. So. Sleep well, yep. everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you have revenues, to, revenue numbers to share with us? No, not so much revenue numbers. Uh, we're moving right along, but uh, mostly I wanted to talk about, and, I, and I'll field any questions from the special session. I know there was a lot of angst when we first got started. Uh, and remember, my job is to try to quell as, uh, as many problems as possible. That's what the majority leader's role is. And, uh, but this time around, it was a little tougher, a little harder. A lot of the bills for the special session, this past ses special session, uh, we got late. Uh, and, and they were still in the process of working them up, trying to get them through. Thankfully, we did have a caucus uh, that afternoon, that Saturday afternoon, to try to get people up to speed. Uh, the House always does its due diligence. So uh, we have no problem sending bills to committee to try to get them vetted out. Majority of the bills were supplementals and spending authorities, so a lot of them went to finance, and finance spent uh, all day Sunday going through uh, most of these bills, vetting them, and uh, I, I think it just makes for a more productive uh, special session. When you actually send bills through committee, you get a chance to ask the agencies the, the uh, tough questions, and you get a chance to vet them out, and I think the finance committee did, did a good job, so... Yeah. Good morning, Eric. I know Mike. I, I know Mike Height is listening, and watching today, so I can ask this question. Over yeah. the years, we've taken great pleasure in the Rob rant. I understand Mike Height did something equivalent to Rob. Would, would you discuss? He did, it? and I listened to him coming down the road. So let me let me just set the scenario. You know, we passed the the Senate's version of the Volunteer Fire Department bill, and uh, we got done. Let's see, Tuesday, I think it would have been around 6 o'clock in the evening. Never would I have thought that the Senate would amend their own bill and send it back to us. But uh, so I decided to leave. And uh, because I had a lot of air conditioning stuff I had to do, a lot of service calls. 
And uh, so, anyways, I'm uh, heading back uh, to Martinsburg, and I'm, I'm I'm hearing that there's been a change, and, and they're wanting the House to concur with the Senate amendment. And lo and behold, I hear Mike Height, and uh, <laughs> he did a very he had a very passionate uh, floor speech, and uh, he did a good job. I'm very proud of him. I, I'm I'm proud of Warren. Beatty. They're both becoming uh, really good delegates. So. Lots and, to be proud of. And, you know, Rob dispenses nicknames and quite appropriate. So now Height's name is the Badger. And, uh, the for, Badger. Yeah, for the Rams. Well, I, there's something to be said with that. Uh, them old Badgers are pretty tough, yeah. you know. Hey, uh, Eric, Eric, going to back uh, to more Pacific business or serious business, uh, you, you covered a lot in this, this session interim. And you cut, You had a good uh, regular um, uh, session last uh, uh, last January, February. What is what is the what are the pressing issues that you'll be looking at this coming January? I'm still looking at uh, tax reform issues, uh, but keep in mind I, I did want to mention something, and I don't know I haven't got a chance to listen listen in much the last couple of days, but something I did want to touch on, and I don't know if you were going to bring it up today, was on the critical vacancy pay. Have you talked about that much? We did the other day quite a bit, but yes, yeah, uh, thanks for bringing it up. Yeah, I mean, the critical vacancy pay is something that we've been trying, what we call locality pay. Uh, we've been stalemated for years, of, but this time around, we were able to get this critical vacancy pay across the finish line. Now, what does that mean for these correctional officers? A new correctional officer, CO1, starting today would make about a $33,214 salary. With the critical uh, vacancy pay, they get bumped up to 45500 starting pay for a CO1. That's a $12,000 increase. That starts to put us in line with, with MCI there in Hagerstown, Maryland. A CO2 would make uh, $35,360 currently under starting pay. They would get bumped up to $50,500. And CO3s, which is where we focused a lot of our talks in consideration for, for raises because we were seeing where that was the the biggest uh, vacancy rates that we were exp uh, experiencing. A CO3 makes $37,650 today. Under the critical vacancy pay in Berkeley County, they're going to get bumped up to 53000 So a big win when it comes to this locality pay, which most of us have, most, most of us have been talking about for years. But remember, a lot of, these pol a lot of this politics is regional, and uh, you'll have members flat out say, I will not vote for a bill that has locality pay. They want everybody paid the same rate all across uh, the state. And unfortunately, we have higher housing costs. Uh, cost of living's more in Berkeley County and Jefferson County and Morgan County. But uh, finally got that across the finish line, so I'm, I'm real happy. Now, the other big takeaway from this whole special session that nobody's really been talking about, and, and I've men mentioned this to Hayden, and Hornby and Hardy and Cump and Horst, Delegate Horst, uh, there was about 70, $781 million that we did not spend. And that's critical and that's key uh, to the taxpayer because you just heard me mention, you asked me what are some of the issues that I plan on working on. Well, one would be more tax relief. So how did we uh, keep back $781 million? Well, very simple. Uh, the budget that we passed this year and the general revenue surplus section of the budget, uh, the legislature decided to spend $1.1 million, but I parked $400 million in a personal income tax reserve fund. Uh, this special session that we just had, uh, we did not spend uh, $150 million of the surplus that was appropriated that we could have spent. So if you take that $400 million and add another $150 million, now you're at $550 million. And then we also decided to change the governor's bill a little bit. Uh, and, and instead of putting um, $85 million into uh, rainy day, we put $231 million. So we prevented about $781 million of spending. That's the big takeaway that I wanted our listeners to hear about. And that will allow great opportunities to further do more tax relief and put more money back into their pockets. Eric, you mentioned uh, critical vacancy pay for the correction officers. Now that the nut has been cracked to some degree, do you see the same model, same approach can be uh, used with the teachers? We have to. It's, it's imperative. I mean, our, now, keep in mind, though, 
along with this, I, I heard a little bit of the last segment. You know, you did speak of, and, and I would say that the word decentralized was a popular word amongst Republicans uh, from 2015 and prior. Uh, and I would agree with you that uh, we do need to become more decentralized. But with that uh, uh, saying, you know, could Berkeley County uh, afford to pay higher salaries to their county employees, like their teachers and, and, uh, and others? Well, the answer is they could, but along with that would have to be some type of uh, revenue stream, and you would have to give counties taxing authority. Now, I'm all for local control, but here we are in this past session, special session. We elected the state legislature to provide more funding for volunteer fire departments when it's clearly a county function and counties have refused to raise any revenues to, to pay forth uh, for these volunteer fire departments. Uh, so we're back to the same mantra again. We want the state to pay for everything, but yet we want to cry for local control. Um, let me, let me interrupt, interrupt just a second. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. need to give a shout out to Berkeley County. Berkeley County yeah. has faced up to paying the, uh, the paid and also providing the volunteers a, a quite a bit of money and equipment. Yeah, there's a lot of these counties that, that just simply re refuse to pass a levy or have a fire or ambulance fee, and these are all functions of county gov government. Berkeley County has been very proactive. Now, if you ask people, do you mind paying a fire fee or an ambulance fee, the answer is going to be no. Nobody enjoys, you know, nobody wants to pay a fee, but if you're asking for these services, somebody's got to pay for the services, and it's either the state or it's going to be the county. In order to do it, if you, if you want local control and if you want to decentralize the state, well, then, obviously, there has to be some type of revenue stream in order to pay for all this. Now, um, one of the things that I, I listened to the last segment we had a Delegate Cump on, keep in mind, I've been advocating for smaller, limited government, and one of the ways to do it at the state level is to have flatline budgets. Uh, and, and what that, in my mind, what will happen is, it will force these state agencies to become more efficient. And um, it, 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 it seems to have, to have been working. I, I, you know, we're seeing surpluses. The, the key to surpluses is not to use for base building. Uh, the key to surpluses is either to give the money back or use it for one-time spend on like deferred maintenance or issues that you have with, uh, you know, with your buildings that you have across the state. But, uh, yeah, if, you're, if you're a strong proponent of limited government, smaller government, well, then you should be very, very supportive of a flatline budget because it keeps government agencies from every year raising their budget. And if you don't, they're just going to continue to raise and spend and spend and spend. So I'm doing everything that I told the people back in 2010 that I would do is try to eliminate as much spending as possible. And I uh, continue to uh, work in ways to accomplish that. But, Eric, one of the consequences of flatline budget is what we've been seeing in corrections. That was a, I'm not going to say totally, but in large part due to the fact that the budget and corrections have remained static. Well, and, and I would disagree, Bill. Here's why. Okay. Because the function of the budget, we funded higher ed this past budget cycle. We funded higher ed $383 million. We funded corrections $343 million. So we're pretty close to funding corrections, the same spot where we're funding higher ed. I believe that the money was there. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to work on is a full-blown audit of uh, corrections just to see exactly. I, I still say that there's management issues that is going on, inefficiencies that are going on. But just for your listeners to understand, fiscal year 24 budget that we just uh, passed in January through March, that session, $343 million. Um, well, I think that's pretty substantial. I think we're funding corrections at the level it needs to be funded. You're, you're, you're making a good point, as you always do. But you all say you'd be like, you'd like, you would what, like, excuse me, having trouble talking this morning. We'd like to uh, do an audit in uh, corrections. Why haven't we done one up to this point in time and made well, an every, audit throughout? Every agencies do get audited. They're on the cycle. But um, I just got to look back to see when the last time corrections were audited. 
but, but I just think it'd be imperative for the taxpayer because, look, we all have to be good stewards of the taxpayer's money. If there are inefficiencies that are happening, I know the answer all the time is just to throw more money at these agencies, and that's not always the answer. So that's why I still believe in the flatline budget. Once again, it frees up uh, opportunities for the taxpayer. Keep in mind, for the taxpayer, because then the taxpayer has the decision whether or not we are going to spend more money either deferred maintenance or if they're demanding more money back in higher tax refunds or if, you know, or if they want more in road money spent in roads. And, and just, just so your listeners know, uh, I pretty much voted yes on every bill except for one during a special session, um, and that was for the road maintenance. There's been uh, several things that are that is possibly coming out of uh, some. Uh, I, I, the word corruption might be a strong word, but there's some things that are coming out that has been happening with our Department of Highways that I'm not very happy about. So uh, I decided to vote no, and uh, I think you're going to start hearing more and more of that stuff on the local airways. And uh, but these are the things that I try to work behind the scenes and, and try to uncover and try to do. And I try not to raise a lot of stink about it. But, uh, no, my job is to try to protect the taxpayer as much as possible. Let me go back very quickly. And, John, uh, this will be my last question. Uh, you're talking about audit. Frequently, an audit is looking at the revenue versus expenditure and stops there. Yes. But I think what you're talking about is a deeper dive and to look at the efficiency in all aspects of a, of a program. Is that correct? Absolutely. And don't forget, most of these agencies have what's called special revenue funds. Anytime there's a piece of le legislation that is passed that has allowed an agency to collect a fee or charge a fee of some sort, they collect uh, surplus revenue or, or special revenue. And our special revenue, you have four billion just in general revenue, about four point eight billion in general revenue. You have another two billion just in special revenue. So uh, a lot of times, I, uh, me, I, I complain a lot that these special revenue accounts are little uh, slush funds for these little fiefdoms, and, uh, and the only way to change that is to go back in and repeal a lot of the legislation that the legislature has passed over the last hundred years or how many years passed uh, that has created a fee but uh, it can it, it's funny every time that there's, there's a piece of legislation that's passed you'll see some special revenue account some legislator wants to create a special revenue account and what they don't realize is when they do that it's a lot harder to get that money out because you're 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 passing a bill with a fee that allows an agency to collect something so if that makes sense to you, Bill. Yes, it does. Thank you. Delegate, Eric Householder is on the phone with us discussing various issues from special session and, and, and other things. Um, Eric, I, when we talk about the flatline budget, let's just stipulate that that's, that's a good thing. N now we get into the practicality of it. While we are returning money to the taxpayers and we are espousing smaller, uh, more efficient government, it seems that if... If you hold out long enough and you don't have, as a county, you don't have a fire levy and you don't have the, the local sources of revenue, if you hold out long enough, that's okay. We'll send money from Berkeley County to Mingo County. I shouldn't, I, or I shouldn't single out other counties, but we will send other people's money down to your fire stations that you, the, the other county isn't concerned enough to actually support on their own. Aren't we actually sort of underwriting bad behavior? I, I, I don't know that I completely understand the question, but if, we're, if we want to put it in perspective of uh, volunteer fire departments, if, if counties are refusing to pass a fire or ambulance fee, and, and that's, the, that's up to the residents, if they don't value that service, what I'm concerned about, that if there's more and more pressure on the state to provide that, I think you've opened up Pandora's box because you're going to get yourself in a position to where you're going to eliminate all volunteers. You're going to have a complete county paid staff, okay? And then at what, at what cost you're going to see pension obligations. You're going to see uh, bigger, more constraints put on county budget, and then there's going to be more cry for the state taxpayer to, to, to help pay for all this. I just think we got to be very cautious, and um, 
One way of doing it is to continue to have the flatline budget to force state agencies, not counties, to force state agencies to become efficient, more efficient, I should say. But on the, specifically on the fire departments, if the state holds holds the line and says flatline yeah. budgets, we're not, we're, your, your county's fire departments are your problems, not the state problems. Um, they are county functions. They are functions of county government, not ex- state. Exactly. Yet... The state bailed them out with this the this new money going in. Right, right. So is and, and that isn't that a contradiction? It is a contradiction. That's what I keep. Some of our members are hell bent on. You know, they're wanting more and more state dollars to to fund these uh, services at the county level. And once again, it's a county function, and we shouldn't. That's why I started by saying the word decentralization was a popular word with Republicans prior to 2015. It seems like more and more people want to centralize state government, and I'm like, no, 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 you don't want to centralize. We're, we're you know, too top-heavy now. We need to keep going in the path of decentralizing state government and giving more local control like like uh, Bill Stubblefield has advocated for years and others have av- advocated. But when you do that, there is a cost, as long as people realize that. But if so, if we establish that as a sort of a baseline philosophy, how does it make sense then for the citizens of outlying counties, you know, the not not border counties, to underwrite additional pay for Berkeley County and Morgan County County teachers when they, in fact, are not reaping the same benefits in their counties? Because if it's a county function, at some point, if the taxpayers in Berkeley County are willing to pay higher uh, fees for whatever the services, whether it's a a teacher pay or a ambulance fee, then those services will be warranted and people will gladly pay them. That's what I'm saying. Most of the time, we'll we'll use Tucker County, for for example, or even uh, Putnam County. I think Putnam County just turned down an ambulance fee. Uh, that's the prerogative of, of the citizens. But by the same token, if it takes an extra half hour for an ambulance to get there, whose fault is it? Is it the state's fault because the state didn't supplement a county function? Or is it the citizens' fault because they didn't value the services? You see what I'm saying? I do. I'm just trying to figure out where the where the division is between state and county funding when it comes to important uh, issues like uh like teacher pay and and that sort of thing. I mean, well, if we're, yeah, the, the the correct answer would be just to decentralize the state, only allow the state to provide those services that the county can't provide. Allow all other county, allow the counties to take care of all other functions, and allow those county residents to pay for those functions that those residents want for that county. If they value a fire and ambulance, then just let them pay for that. If they buy ed- education then obviously they're going to have a higher personal property tax or a higher real estate tax, whatever that case may be, whatever that revenue stream is. But it's up to the citizens of that county. It's not up to the legislature to di- to dictate Berkeley County should be mandated to pay this, Morgan County should be mandated to pay that. It should be a local county government and local control. Is there a string that Berkeley County could pull to just unilaterally give Berkeley County teachers more pay? No, not right now. What would we're it trying take? With, we're, we're, well, once again, we're trying with locality pay, but that's that's the that's the problem that we're running up against. Remember, uh, I brought a bill down to the House floor last year just for three hundred thousand dollars for state police officers in Berkeley County, and that turned into a thirty million dollar bill where we got to pay all state troopers across the state. So that's the problem that we're having. But it, I'm confused now. Locality pay is state money, right? If we're going to pay Berkeley County teachers more, that would be state money, correct? Yes. Okay. Is there a way to make that? Is there legislation they can pass that would allow the Berkeley County or or any county uh, uh, commissions or, or councils to establish the pay grade for their own teachers, irrespective of what other other <laughs> other counties are making? Yeah, not as of right now, yeah. but this, it's been talked about and talked about till we're all blue in the face. But by the same token, if you ever reach that plateau, the next question would be, well, how would Berkeley County pay for this? Now, Bill Stubblefield has advocated for years for a 1% sales tax. Okay, more local control. 
So would the residents of Berkeley County want to pay an additional 1% sales tax and use that revenue to pay higher teacher salaries? I don't know what the answer to that is, yeah. but that's a decision that the voters would have to make. Yeah. Uh, correction, Eric. I've never specifically advocated the woman's sales tax. What I've advocated is to give enough arrows in the quiver of the county commission that they can manage the revenue stream. There is a real fear, at least historically, on the part of the legislators. Don't give these county commissions the authority to adjust taxes. There will be a runaway taxation. And there could be. That's, there, could, that's there, the there, with, there could be, yes. But yeah. but the, we've given the legislators uh, faith in what they're doing. I would think we could give the, uh, our county government the comparable faith. Most of them are extremely reasonable, plus they're all going to be facing the electors. I don't think you're going to find runaway taxation on the part of the county commissioners. Not for two election well, cycles. Yeah, yeah. but that... And I apologize if I painted you with a broad brush there, but that was the point I was trying to make, uh, that some counties you could have runaway taxation, some counties you may. It all depends on what are the citizens willing to pay for, what services, okay, in that county. That's right. You and can that's put, the answer that yep. county residents would have to answer, you know, through uh, you know, local referendums, yep. you know, whether they want an ambulance fee, a levy fee, uh, or a fire fee, whatever that, the case may be. Yeah, I agree, and it's. Uh, but I, I'll still continue to advocate. Let's get that as much as we can to the local government, and they yes. should and could use a referendum to make these decisions. I agree with you. Yeah. All right, that brings us to nine thirty-two. Thank you so much, Delegate Householder, for joining us and being so patient yep. with us. You guys have a great day. Thanks. All right, you too. Thanks, sir. As always. Yep.